Is it okay if I just talk from here? Okay. Uh, PPAVs refer to principally polarized abelian varieties. It's just uh, I didn't have space to write it. Orbital integrals and the Steinberg Hitchin base. So some of these things actually came up uh, in the uh, in the workshop in the lectures last week, especially orbital integrals and the uh, the Steinberg base. And we're going to see how these things actually relate the uh, principally polarized abelian varieties and the. The aim of the talk is the following. So Gekeler, Ulrich Gekeler, actually had a uh, beautiful paper in 2003 where he expresses the number of elliptic curves that are iso isogenous to a given elliptic curve as a local mass formula. And he writes down the mass as a very, uh, in a very nice form, and uh, he basically uh, obtains a siegel type mass formula for the isogeny class. So I. He gives a beautiful proof, but the proof is a little bit uh, kind of like brute force. So uh, the whole premise of the talk is basically to put Gekeler's uh, proof in a little bit of a more conceptual form and to generalize it to a uh, higher genus. So Gekeler does this for elliptic curves, in other words, for genus 1 abelian varieties. And then uh, the end result will be to generalize it to higher genus. And the outline, roughly, I will go over Gekeler's model. So he actually puts up a somewhat probabilistic model for calculating these number of abelian varieties, number of principally polarized, well, number of elliptic curves in an isogenic class in this case. And then I will go over Gekeler's proof. This part will be uh, in uh, a little bit detail, so maybe in excruciating detail, actually, because this will actually uh, put us to uh, the Langlands cockpit <laughs> realm, and we will see why it is. it may be important to actually do things in a little bit more systematically, because this proof it's pretty hard to actually generalize it to higher genus. Okay, so the setup will be, I'll be working over a finite field with P elements. So this is just for uh, expository purposes, because if I work with Q elements, I need to introduce a lot more material. And hope, well, sometimes it will be F FQ, because you know, quite often I actually mistype P to Q. Uh, e will denote an elliptic curve over FP or FQ. Uh, so F will be the Frobenius endomorphism of E, and T will be the trace of F. So for, I mean, just to say it, like ev everything that is valid over FP is valid over FQ, actually. It's proved over FQ. Okay. So, I'm sorry, I can't see. <laughs> um, so let me start with basics. Uh, let's recall that the number of points on over FP of this elliptic curve is P plus one minus T, where this T is the uh, trace of the Frobenius. And for the trace of Frobenius, we have the famous Hasse bound, which says that this trace cannot be larger than two root P in absolute value. So this is the Archimedean bound, which bounds all these traces. So we ask ourselves, uh, can we actually get a curve for each one of these numbers? So there are roughly four square root p numbers over here. And the thing is, yes, one can actually find a curve like a, which attains this. So for each t, a curve with the given number of points. And uh, let me just go over this quickly because it's kind of cute. So t, t will be the trace of Frobenius. And for the ones who attended last week's lecture, just a heads up, this T is the M of last week's lecture, whatever that means. So T will determine an order in the quadratic extension, Q square root of T squared minus 4P, with discriminant of this order is going to be T squared minus 4P. For all this game, I'll fix P. And then we look at the uh, Hilbert class polynomial, which is just the uh, product over all E with CM by the prescribed order. So now it is a fact that this guy has, is monic with coefficients in z and splits over fp. So here I'm assuming that e is ordinary and this will be always the assumption so let's forget about the super singular case for a second. And each root of this will be the j invariant of an e with, uh, which satisfies this guy. So the upshot is all of these numbers are satisfied, all of these numbers are taken for some e. Now then we ask the T statistics of this, no pun intended. Um, so we're fixing a T. Let's assume that it defines a curve, which is not super singular. Uh, and that satisfies, so it's allowed, so to speak. So it's admissible. And set the following. We're going to count the number of elliptic curves over FP with the given Frobenius endomorphism. Uh, we're 
weighing each elliptic curve by the uh, inverse of the automorphism group, which is pretty standard, and I'm going to be denoting such sums with a, with a star right here, so that whenever we see a star, we basically see each object that is summed over is weighted by the inverse automorphism, as usual. And the question is, how large is NTP? So, I mean, of course, this question may mean a lot of things. Do I want an asymptotic formula? Do I like, it? what does how large mean? I mean, if possible, I would actually like to count this exactly. And uh, the best way, probably, to look at what we expect is a crude heuristic. Okay, the total number of these uh, elliptic curves is p. In this case, we can actually count them, so that's uh, pretty straightforward. So the total number of objects without this t0 requirement is p. And then we have roughly squared p elements here that this t can actually uh, be. So if we assume that everything is fairly normally distributed and uniformly distributed, you would expect that the number of uh, elements is roughly square root of p in each isogeny class. So this turns out to actually be the rough number. Well, I gave this talk a fair amount of times, and sometimes I get, a, uh, I get an objection to what this symbol means. So this symbol is not supposed to mean anything for now, but it's just roughly to give you an idea what to expect over here, but if you really wanted to put something, this, uh, what I mean is like time, type of a Brouwer's eagle there, so it's like p to the one half plus epsilon, p to the minus, uh, one half minus epsilon type of thing, so to be a little bit more precise. But I mean, we, could, we may as well just leave it as it is. Uh, for super singular curves, maybe I should also say, so super singular curves are not, we're not going to count, uh, care about them for the following reason, they're only, uh, so many of them, and they're all either defined over fp or fp square, and when we take p to be q and large, they're not gonna, they're not gonna be that many of these guys, so I will basically ignore them. So super singular curves are the ones which are t0 equals, well, in this case, t0 equals zero, but in general, just zero mod p. Okay, so, well, the previous heuristic, which, let me know, this square root of p is a little bit too crude, it turns out, I mean, one would expect that. So, uh, although this slide says correct scale of p to the one half, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to make correct scale precise, but uh, one basic, well, th this is like the leading term, so it actually gives the right order of magnitude in a sense, in a prescribed sense, that will become clear in a second, but then it is a little bit too crude because we have the following theorem of Birch from 1968, so if you denote the probability density function of t over square root p by f t comma p, so by which I mean the probability of obtaining a t over square root p between a and b is like roughly the uh, integral of this function. Uh, then this function actually approaches a, uh, a continuous distribution as p approaches infinity, which is 1 over 2 pi square root of 4 minus tau squared d tau. And of course, for the ones who have seen this before, this is just a sort of Tate measure on, the, on SC2. And one thing that will come up actually here uh, quite often is this 4 minus tau squared is the discriminant function of uh, GSP2 or GL2, uh, the wild discriminant. And this 2 pi, one should read as 2 pi to 1. So there's an exponent over here that I didn't write, which is one, which corresponds to uh, the elliptic curve having genus one. Okay, so our initial heuristic, which basically said p to the one half, is not exactly true because this is basically saying, for instance, things are uh, more probable to get actually, there may be more elliptic curves when this tau, which is like t over p, is actually closer to say like zero rather than like four. Okay, so we can try to modify our heuristic, and we can say, okay, uh, maybe our NTP, which was the number of elliptic curves with a given trace of Frobenius over FP is, you know, proportional to this number now, uh, as well as this P to the one half. Okay, that's good, and uh, this actually accounts for the Archimedean correction term, so for the, uh, for the real correction, this will turn out to be enough. But, well, the elliptic curve is a structure over uh, QP, for a QL, for every QL, and uh, maybe we want to actually talk about 
and uh, consider what the elatic uh, correction firms or correction terms and refinements would be. Okay. So for that, for each n, which is not divisible by p, we have the Frobenius endomorphism, and it acts on the n division points, and it gives rise to a well-defined conjugacy class in uh, GL2 z mod n z. So this conjugacy class, we may naively maybe expect the following. So we look at the guys. So remember, we're trying to count the number of uh, elliptic curves with a given trace of Frobenius from from this, we are getting a conjugacy class for z mod n z for each one of these n's. And we may say, if everything is uniformly distributed again, maybe an individual conjugacy class is roughly, uh, the probability of hitting one is, well, this is not exactly a probability, but pretty much looks like one, the local mass, would be uh, the individual conjugacy class right here, which is attached to this Frobenius, divided by the average size of a semi-simple conjugacy class in GL2 z mod n z. So this guy is a uh, semi-simple class. Um, and then, of course, I mean, there are multiple things to be shown here. First of all, like, does this limit converge and stuff? Well, it does. Uh, we, will, we will see that in a second, but it's not a priori clear. And this average size of the semi-simple conjugacy class is actually kind of nice. It's n squared times. That's a very nice expression where the zeta l's are the local L functions of, uh, local L factors of the Riemann zeta function. And we could be a little bit more uniform about this. Instead of looking at a whole N, we could look at these correction factors prime by prime. And uh, well, for each L not equal to P, we have this Frobenius actually acted on, on, acting on uh, the H1 EZL and its counterpart, uh, counterpart at ZP. And for each one of these, we can define the local mass, which is the analog of this local mass, as calculating the number of matrices that are conjugate, that are in the conjugacy class of gamma of L, modulo L to the K first. So remember, we are looking at ZL, so we're taking a, an inverse limit, essentially, when K goes to infinity. Uh, let me remind one thing, that it's not a priori clear that this limit exists. Well, we, are, we need to count, but it's not very hard to show that this actually stabilizes most of the times after k equals 1, actually. And it always stabilizes after finite k, so it's not too bad. Uh, then we can think about the non-Archimedean refinement as maybe our NTP is roughly uh, proportional to the product of these new Ls. So, of course, I mean, this is... This is a very uh, naive heuristic, so to speak, because it has a lot of things hidden at the background. Well, first of all, well, it is this time it is actually a big problem that this may not actually converge, because this is, uh, this is an infinite product of local factors, and maybe I should make a reference for last, like yesterday again. So these will be close to L factors. So this, this product will converge, but it will only converge conditionally. So it is actually uh, a little bit subtle. This will be the L factors that we have seen on last week's talk for those ones who attach. I, I will review that later. Uh, and then in this refinement, I should also maybe say that implicitly we're assuming that the distributions are independent because otherwise you cannot just take the product uh, to get like a mass. But, well, since we are talking about crude about heuristics, we may as well assume that and see how close we are to the reality. Okay, just to recap, okay, then the Archimedean and non-Archimedean refinements. So these basically give local oscillations. At infinity, we have this uh, factor from the Sata Tate measure or Birch's theorem. And for each L at each uh, finite place, we have the local masses coming from the elatic places, the elatic action of the Frobenius. Uh, just to say this is 1 over 2 times the 2 pi times the discriminant. Yeah, one should basically read this as 1 over 2 pi to g, where g is 1, times the discriminant of, a, of, a, of an element gamma in GL2q with trace t and determinant p. And this new L of tp is counting the number of conjugacy classes, uh, sorry, number of elements in the fixed conjugacy class of Frobenius, because each Frobenius is well-defined once we fix e and, uh, once we fix t and p, 
uh, divided by the average size of the uh, conjugacy class. Okay, so this was uh, a naive heuristic. Now, the uh, amazing fact is that this actually gives the exact correct answer. It's not no longer like an asymptotic or anything. For each p, well, I'm going to, okay, so when I say p, I will not consider 2 and 3 as primes for this talk. So p is a large prime for, for us, for all that matters. And t will be less than square root p, and p, well, t will denote, t will be the Frobenius endomorphism of an ordinary elliptic curve. And then the number of elliptic curves that are FP isogenous to this given, or that, that are in this isogeny class, so to speak, are given by square root p, which was our initial very crude heuristic, new infinity, which was the uh, Sadotate or Birch correction, and then the elatic weight factors, elatic masses right here. Um, so this is a beautiful formula, of course, and these are pretty much computable, like each one of them is, you can just code a program. I mean, these things, uh, these matrices, uh, these numbers, these limits, they converge literally after k equals 1 for most, most L. So you could just write down a program that calculates these things pretty much. And we're going to calculate them in a second, but uh, it is a beautiful formula. So Gekeller proved this in his 2003 paper in the IMRN, and uh, the proof the proof actually is, uh, well, okay, so maybe a little bit of a remark. So this is a ziegel weitab mass formula. So these are each our local masses. This is the Archimedean factor, and these each L are basically the local uh, elatic masses. Okay, so, oh, and if anybody is interested in looking at Gekeler's, uh, Gekeler's uh, paper, which is a beautiful paper, I completely recommend it, it's a, it's a great read. Uh, he uses a different normalization, so if you see everything off by 2, that is because he's counting 2 times NTP, just uh, a heads up, so to speak. Okay, so now I want to actually go over Gekeler's proof because it's instructive, and uh, it actually tells us a lot about like what is going on at the background. But at the same time, it doesn't tell us much about the uh, theory, or like how to, uh, how to generalize this, if we can, for anything that is uh, not... Genus 1. So he proceeds by a direct calculation, basically. So what, what does he do? He starts with the theorem of Deering, of course. Uh, this is a well-known, I mean, most of these are well-known, by the way. I'm going over the uh, well-known stuff. So the theorem of Deering calculates the number of, or writes the number of elliptic curves in a fixed isogeny class as a class number. Uh, well, he actually does much more. He classifies the endomorphism algebras, but uh, we're just going, a consequence of what he does, let's say, is the following. Let's give ourselves a discriminant D, which will be T squared minus 4P. This is the same quantity that appeared in Birch's theorem, and like for us. And D0 will be the actual field discriminant of Q, Q square root D. So we're gonna always write this D as the S squared times the fundamental discriminant. So any discriminant has the, uh, this type of decomposition, then Birch gives us the following. So the number of elements in the isogeny class is a sum over f dividing this index, basically the index of this order in the uh, maximal order, such that we're looking at the weighted class numbers of these suborders of these. Of course, by now we are very familiar throughout the uh, lectures of last week and the week before, that this, 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 this is a familiar object which will come over and over again. This is actually a little bit of a spoiler. We have seen this last week when we were talking about orbital integrals. Okay, so HD is the class number of the order here, and W or F squared D is the number of roots of unity in this order. So he starts with Deering's formula, and then he goes on and calculates local masses literally explicitly. So he basically looks at each L, calculates the number of elements in this uh, conjugacy class by hand. Uh, let me just tell you, show you what this is. So again, we are having this D to be T squared minus 4P. D0 is the discriminant, the uh, fundamental discriminant, and we're writing the uh, index of the order is S. And we are letting, for each L, we are defining this quantity delta L to be the elatic absolute value of, well, the elatic valuation of this S. So these things, this will basically determine how far deep we are going in the, uh, like, away from the maximal order. And according to Gekeler, this new LTP, 
can be calculated as the zeta factor at 2 times 1 plus 1 over L minus, there's a correction factor here, it's either 0 or L plus 1 over this quantity or 2 over this. So here, note that the 0 over L, this is the Legendre symbol, and it is describing the local behavior of the extension Q square root D. Elatically, this means it is split or unramified or ramified. So the middle one is ramified, the extension, the local extension, the last one is unramified, and the uh, first one is ramified. Uh, maybe a remark is that for almost all we, we have delta L of is zero, actually, because this, this quantity is just a rational, well, it's an integer, actually, so it's only divisible by finitely many primes. And whenever delta L is zero, you can actually see and D0 will not be uh, divisible by L, so this part is just obsolete. So we are either 0 or 2 over L, so we're basically looking at the L factor of the uh, Dirichlet um, L function, D0 over L. These things have been appearing over and over, but uh, once he calculates this, he has two more ingredients. Well, first of all, here's the a very well-known class number relation which relates the class number of the order to uh, the class number of, wait a second, there's a, uh, well, oh, okay, so the class number of the order to the class number of the field, okay. So it is basically saying the ratio of this is just a product over primes dividing f. So if the index of the order is f, and these primes actually, these are just correction factors for the class number of the order, well-known uh, objects. And then we also have the analytic class number formula, which relates the, uh, the L values that appeared right here to these class numbers. So he puts everything together. And then he shows that the Euler products one gets using this uh, analytic class number formula and the class number relation are exactly the ones that he actually calculated for these new Ls. So let me remind you one thing though, these calculations of new Ls, although they're pretty much straightforward for most Ls, when uh, the order is ramified, these things are actually quite uh, detailed. Especially at two, they're quite, they're quite messy calculations. So this is a beautiful, beautiful theorem. And uh, it's somewhat expected. I mean, he actually starts with like, you know, he's very surprised that nobody has written it down. Uh, we're gonna see why it is expected. But let me take a detour. So after 2003, when uh, Gekela wrote this up, Nick Katz wrote a bulletin art article in 2009 where he talks about Lang Trotter and related problems over uh, function fields, number fields, and he has he actually spends a considerable amount of space discussing uh, Gekeler's proof and Gekeler's model and how it can be generalized maybe, but he's only talking about elliptic curves. Mainly he's thinking about adding a level structure. And he does it and uh, he, uh, he talks about like possible ways of extending it and how those possible ways may or may not work. But he makes the following remark at the very end. So this is remark 8.7. This is literally the page before the end of the paper. Uh, and it's at the bottom of the page. So it's pretty easy to miss. So he says, perhaps with a more conceptual approach, one could also verify the conjectures for the more general moduli problems. Don't worry about what he considers. What is the relation of the conjecture formula to the formula in terms of orbital integrals given by Kotwitz when the general formula is specialized to the case of elliptic curves? So the take from this is basically there are formulas of Kotwitz, if uh, anybody is not familiar with these, that count certain objects. And Katz was asking, is there a conceptual way to prove this isogeny, the, uh, the theorem of Gekeler's by just going through Kotwitz's formulas and relating these isogeny classes to certain orbital integrals so that you can avoid this uh, calculation that Gekeler has done. Because that calculation is hard to do for, for general moduli space or like for anything more general than elliptic curves, so to speak. Okay, so uh, the rest of the, uh, well, first of all, so this is, uh, all right, let, let me start with the following one. So the theorem that we proved in uh, 2017 was uh, actually, so this generalizes Gekeler. So we generalize Gekeler's formula to, okay, so this is FQ. That's why I meant Q is P sometimes. 
So this is FQ. So Gekeller only gives a proof for FP. So elliptic curves over finite field of P elements. We work with general, general Qs. And basically, that is not that much of a deal, but like it conceptualizes, it gives a conceptual proof why are the langlands kotwitz formula and an integration over the Seinberg base. So there's not much, well, there's no explicit calculation, basically, except for like one point. So maybe I should take a step back and digress a little bit, because I usually, uh, so how, I want to tell you how I actually got involved in this, uh, in this project. So although the theorem actually goes back to 2017, the way I got involved in this project goes back to 2012. So when I first, I was giving a, a series of lectures on beyond endoscopy and uh, at Columbia University at that point, and at the end of one of these lectures, one of the uh, person in the audience, it's uh, Luis Garcia, came up and said, you know, there's this uh, paper of Katz's. Can, maybe your methods can actually be used in uh, this Gekeller's thing. So I was like, okay, I mean, that sounds very interesting. Uh, this was 2012, so the first time I could actually get my hands on this was 2015, three years before I could even start. But let me show you what actually goes on. So, in Beyond Endoscopy, so Langlands wrote a paper called Beyond Endoscopy, which is one of the themes of this conference, and on, so this paper is in 2004, but it, it actually goes back to 2000 and then 2002. I think the major draft was actually 2002. So this, and this has nothing to do with Gekeller's paper. It is like literally nothing to do with it. So on page 42, Langlands does the following calculation. He says, he claims, first of all, that uh, this thing, this object right here, is the product of, so these UMs are orb orbital integrals, but it really doesn't matter what he's calculating, but all I want to emphasize is, I hope everybody can read this, we have seen this quantity in like four or five slides ago. And then we also have seen this guy, but uh, maybe like less explicitly in Gekeller's calculation, so let me actually do the following. On the other hand, in Gekeller, in 2004, the following lemma appears in page 12. He has this like S, F, D, zero, whatever, blah, blah, and he says, let F be L to the K prime, and then this S, F, D, zero is this quantity right here. So if you look at this for one second, you're gonna see that this quantity is this quantity, where D is D zero. Um, so, Basically, Langlands is calculating the exact same thing that Gekeller is calculating, just aiming at the different, maybe a little bit more ambitious goal. So this is how, we, uh, how I all started. I was like, okay, so there's this formula, there's that formula, you know, maybe things are actually, uh, things can work out. Uh, and again, of course, these are basically calculating the same quantity. So let me tell you what they're calculating. So again, we are letting this t squared minus 4p is the discriminant of our order. And we're letting this d to be s square d zero. So Langlands is calculating a certain orbital integral. So maybe a remark is that his d is Gekeller's d zero. I, I already remarked this. And his calculation is the orbital integral of a gamma with trace t and determinant p of a certain specific test function. This is, maybe I should also note, this is missing the Archimedean orbital integral. So this is only a product over finite places. So the Archimedean part is not involved in this one. Uh, Fp means a test function at p, and F superscript p means a product of test functions away from p. I will talk about this in a second. On the other hand, we have already seen Gekeller is indeed calculating this, uh, this ratio of weighted class numbers of the uh, order with the weighted class number of the fundamental discriminant. So, moreover, we can uh, keep going. So for this gamma, this particular gamma with trace T and determinant P, the centralizer, the, uh, over the Q points of the centralizer can be identified with the restriction of scalars of this guy, uh, of GM, and one can use this to just easily calculate this volume, G gamma of A finite, over uh, divided by G gamma Q, and note that this volume is actually, uh, this makes sense because this is an anisotropic torus in our case because of uh, the Archimedean restriction on T. Um, and this volume turns out to be H of D zero over omega. 
Now, okay, that's, that's quite intriguing, that's quite nice. So then when we multiply these volumes, we basically get this Turing's formula. So Turing was saying that this thing is uh, just the uh, number of things in the isogeny class defined by this T over FP. So this is the left-hand side. This is literally that. And actually, this, this, this kind of proves what, uh, well, not kind of, it gives a proof. But Turing's result, again, as I was saying, is much more general than this. So this is just the numeric, numerical consequence of Turing. So let's not even worry about that. So maybe a digression two is, uh, I mean, this is just for uh, pleasure, so to speak. This will not be very much uh, important. But so Langlands wrote another paper after Beyond Endoscopy. Let me remind you, Beyond Endoscopy was 2004. And then there were two papers that came in. Uh, he wrote one paper, one joint paper with Frank Hill and Ngo. And uh, that was 2010 or 11. And then on top of that, he had a follow-up paper in 2013, which is called Singularities and Transfer, uh, where on page 46, he does certain calculations. Okay, so maybe I should tell you what the Singularities and Transfer paper is about. It again has nothing to do with Gekeler or anything about elliptic curves. He basically is trying to talk about a stable-to-stable -stable trace, uh, sorry, transfer for a cell two and tori. Well, obviously, we haven't talked about any of that here. But in order to talk about it, I mean, he, he does a brute force approach over there, and he calculates stable orbital integrals for a cell two. And this is the orbital integral for the, uh, the, he the, the, the Heike operator, or the function whose trace on uh, an induced representation is the symmetric mth power of the uh, Langlands parameter of that, or it's a Teke parameter in this case. So he has this calculation when if T is split, he has this, T is unramified, T is ramified, he has all these, these things. And if you have great memory, you would immediately go back like six slides or something and see that this is exactly what I wrote as uh, Gekeler's calculation for the local L factors, sorry, local masses over here. For each L, well, V is L. Moreover, you're taking M to be zero here. So take M to be zero, so these terms are gone. And here, the delta is the same delta that we have defined, and this capital delta is the discriminant function of uh, GL2, so this is four minus T squared, basically. Okay, so as I was saying, if you take M equals zero, and if you, you need to multiply Gekeler to get rid of this L factor right here, these two quantities are basically calculating the same thing. The only thing is you need to, first line is the first line here, if you're interested, if you're were, uh, curious. The second line is the last line here, and this line is the middle line. So the ramified torus appears in the middle line. Okay, so this definitely uh, put us in business, like at least me in my mind. Uh, and what we wanted to try is to give a conceptual proof of this uh, Gekeler formula. How does this proof go? Well, Kotwitz, Kotwitz in the 80s, well, or early 90s, he gave a proof of Langland's uh, Rappaport conjecture for PL type Shimura varieties. And more, more, he did more, but we will only need PL type for this, for this talk. He gives an expression for, uh, for, so this conjecture gives an expression for the mod Q points of these in terms of certain volumes weighted by orbital integrals. So the reason I'm actually writing as vo volumes weighted by orbital integrals as opposed to orbital integrals weighted by volumes is, in my mind, the main contribution or the, uh, the interesting or like the, the, the weird thing is the volumes. But of course, I'm going to tell you a second, in a second, this all is a matter of normalization. If you normalize the me measures the way Kotbitz normalizes, the volumes are mysterious. They're very arithmetic. If you normalize measures in a different way, we will see that things actually change drastically. So this is just a very quick kind of like a, uh, a bird's view of what he does. He breaks up the... Uh, uh, the moduli space into isogeny classes and expresses the number of members of each isogeny class as these orbital integrals. And then he puts a, a specific test function at the Archimedean place and realizes the whole thing as the uh, geometric, like elliptic part of the trace formula. Anyways, well, we will only need this. We, we're not going to need the whole thing, obviously. We will only need this for now to, uh, for, for the case of elliptic curves. So we specialize to G equals GL2, which is GSP2 in this case. And I will always write the sim, uh, symplectic group as GSP2G. So this is G equals 1 case. 
Uh, and in this case, I believe this formula goes back to Langlands and probably, like most certainly goes back to Eichler, Shimura, and Ihara, Ihara, if not anybody else. Uh, and it basically gives the following expression. I have already written it up. The NTQ is this volume term. This is the volume of certain volume associated to the centralizer of gamma times the orbital integral. Here, let me remind you what these test functions are. So GQ, so gamma is the GQ conjugacy class of Frobenius. So trace of T's, trace of gamma is T, determined as P. This is the, the fixed trace. These P and T are fixed for us. So if P is, again, as I was saying, uh, will be the unit element of the Heck algebra is outside of P, and at P we will be the characteristic, we will take the characteristic function of the following double coset. So this is spherical. Everything is spherical. And the volume that we actually have for the orbital integral, the weighing the orbital integral, is defined as follows. The volume is the volume of the centralizers, so centralizer times G gamma a finite, and the remark is this is an isotropic mod center, so this thing actually makes sense. Uh, it's a finite volume. And the orbital integral is the uh, product of all these orbital integrals. So it's, this product, once again, runs over only finite places, so no Archimedean component. So there's one caution that will basically be the under, underlying theme of all this. So when one is describing all of these quantities, one sets, one fixes measures. So in the calculation, we have implicitly assumed the following measure normalizations. For each L, we'll define the canonical measure. This CAN actually uh, refers to the canonical measure. Uh, that gives measure one to the integral points of G and, its, uh, and the centralizer. So this, whenever you see a CAN, you basically immediately think the standard measure that we put on that gives measure one to centralizers. Uh, so, sorry, integral points. The whole, and this is very important to keep in mind, the whole game will be uh, the following. So langlands cockbitz formula expresses this, the size of the isogeny class as the volume calculated with respect to the canonical measure and a product of orbital integrals calculated with respect to the canonical measure. So the first step is that this formula replaces Dürer's theorem, which explicitly gave the number of points in the isogeny class as a class number. So here's the class number, that is the volume for this measure, and the rest is these uh, local oscillations that actually appeared in Dürer's theorem. So the next step is how do we actually relate these quantities to local masses? And the thing is, well, for this particular case for GL2, as we have seen in Langlands, you can actually calculate these things very explicitly. But we would like to rather not do that. And it's not just because Katz asked us to do so, which would have been actually a fairly good motivation anyways, uh, or because we're lazy, which would have been equally well of a motivation. Uh, it is just because we simply are unable to in any generality. So we really cannot calculate it for more than GL2, essentially, and GL3 maybe. Uh, there are certain inductive, there, there are certain procedures which give an inductive formula for uh, higher rank groups, but like, I mean, for this type of a Ziegel mass formula, uh, what is the formula good for if you don't know what it is doing locally? So we want to somehow relate these guys to local masses that appeared on the right-hand side, and the connection goes through the uh, steinberg hitchin base, or the Steinberg base, introduced this time in a paper by Frank and langlands in 2010. Again, this was actually in the concept uh, context of beyond endoscopy. Once again, we saw these things, uh, this base definitely appeared several times in the last two weeks. And comes in very handy in certain things. So the primary purpose of the FLM paper, this is Frank L. Langlands, the goal was to uh, write the elliptic part of the stable trace formula as a sum over uh, the steinberg hitchin base and to do a certain Poisson sum or like certain analysis because this thing is actually an affine space basically. Like, pretty much. Uh, but they highlighted basically the semi-simple stable conjugacy class are parametrized by the space, so they wanted to write down the uh, stable trace formula. So for, from now on, I'm going to define, I'm going to denote the Steinberg Hitchin base by B for any G. I mean, G will be fixed and noted, I mean, it will be clear from the context most of the time, so it will be SP2G. And 
the G of SP2G is lowercase g. So we will also denote the map sending a semi-simple class to its image on B by C. This is basically the characteristic polynomial, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial map. So I will not be defining this in any generality. I will only talk about it in the context that I want and I know, uh, that I need. And uh, the typical example is GLM plus one. For GLM plus one, the space is AN cross GM, and you're basically sending a gamma, a, a, a rational element, or an adelic element for that, that matters, that is semi-simple to the coefficients of its characteristic polynomial. And for the GSP2G, you can think about this as sending an element to the first G coefficients of the characteristic polynomial because of the symmetry of the characteristic polynomial. So basically, the C, this map C, is taking an element and mapping it to, so to speak, its characteristic polynomial. That's like heuristically how one can think about this. It's a very mysterious map, I should note, although it looks very, very explicit, what it is actually doing is very unclear, because at the base, the base is pretty much a linear space, and if you add two characteristic polynomials, I'm not sure what you get upstairs. So it, it is doing something non-trivial. That's, that's all I'm trying to uh, say. So in the FLM paper, what they want to do, again, is the, uh, to write the elliptic part, and for that, they need to express orbital integrals. And what they do is they express orbital integrals as uh, integration on, as an integral over the fibers of this. Of course, one can, uh, uh, one can imagine this happening. But one thing I need to make sure is what kind of measure you put on this, uh, on the space, on the setting. So we have G mapping onto the affine space. The affine space has a very standard measure. It's just the uh, standard, like, dB measure. Uh, and on G, you basically pick, a, pick an algebraic differential form, something that is geometric. And then on each fiber here, <coughs> excuse me, you define a measure by just integration, or by, uh, by requiring the following integration formula to be actually satisfied. So you, have the, you want the double integral to be the integral over uh, G. And you can do that. And we will refer to this as the geometric measure. So, this, already, this also defines a measure on the centralizers, but I'm not going to uh, go over them. I'll go over that in very detail. But let's go back to the proof. So uh, just to recap, we have two different measures. Langlands Cockpits expresses this, uh, the size of the isogeny class as a canonical measure. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, canonical measure, which gives measure one to maximal compact, the standard thing. And we have this uh, new way of writing the orbital integral as the, fi as the integral of a fiber. And, well, the first thing that you do is to relate the orbital integrals, the geometric orbital integrals, in other words, the orbital integrals with respect to the geometric measure to these local masses. And this is a very, fairly simple formula. The local masses are related to, these are essentially the geometric orbital integral. This, this, P, this, this factor is gonna be one almost everywhere. Okay, that is great. Then the next thing is then you wanna compare this geometric to what Langlands Cockpits gives. Just fairly, this is also very straightforward. This is just an application of like a, uh, basically a while integration formula calculation. That's not too bad. And one can do this. And okay, so these local masses are related to geometric. Geometric is related to canonical. This is lovely. This D gamma nowadays, now I'm writing, this is the same quantity that appeared in Birch and everything, but now we're writing it in a more compact form. And then when we put everything together, we're saying, okay, so we wanted to calculate this quantity. Langlands Cockpits gives this as a product of orbital integrals and volumes. Then we calculate these canonical. They are related to the geometric by this formula. This is just a local change of variables formula. And then for geometric, we count. And this count is, uh, this count literally goes through the definition of how you integrate over, uh, over the fibers of the map. Okay, great. So the last ingredient is we had this volume factor, and this volume factor you basically calculate uh, by hand in this particular case. Because you can, because it's a very easy calculation. The volume factor is just a special value of an L function, and then when you multiply everything together, you basically see that the volume factor cancels with all these L values that actually come in, and you basically get Kekulé's formula. So this is, our proof in excruciating detail. So why did I give it in this much detail? Because what we want to do is to actually generalize this to higher dimension, higher genus. 
Okay, so Kekulé's result is about a Siegel mass formula. Okay, so Siegel mass formulas are great. Uh, it expresses an isogeny class, an ordinary elliptic curve. So we are asking what can we do for a, an ordinary principally polarized abelian variety over, of an arbitrary genus. So here again, P will be Q, but uh, that would require like twisted orbital integrals and stuff, so I don't want to talk about that. Okay, again, what, what do we expect? Crude heuristics. So uh, the dimension of the moduli space this time is GG plus 1 over 2. So I'm talking about the complex dimension. On the other hand, well, you can just count the uh, number of A polynomials. These are polynomials that are allowed, these uh, admissible polynomials. And there are Q to the GG plus 1 over 4 of them. So if it, life is fair, you would basically expect Q to the GG plus 1 over 4 as the number of well, I'm saying simple here for uh, just for heuristic purposes, principally polarized abelian varieties. And not to lie to you too much, I'm assuming two things here implicitly, that there are not too many Vey polynomials corresponding to isogeny classes with no principal polarization. And I'm also assuming that when there is a principal polarization, there are not too many different principal polarizations so that you know, these numbers don't fluctuate too much around the, uh, the mean. Okay, so the next thing is, from GL2, now we're going to GSP2G. Much bigger group, but still a nice group. Okay, this group, just to give you a recap, it is just uh, the things that uh, commute with the symplectic form up to a uh, similitude character. And since we will be fixing our finite field, this similitude character will also be fixed, uh, always be fixed as P. So we will be looking at those gammas in this group for which the multiplier is P. Uh, so we can refine this whole thing uh, following the refinements that we have done in the, uh, in the elliptic curve case, both Archimedean and non-Archimedean. So for the non-Archimedean, we have the local Frobenius conjugacy class over, uh, over the base field. So I'm going to actually make a remark about this, so I'll come back to this in a second. This is calculating the number of things that are conjugate to gamma L div uh, divided by an, R, uh, an average conjugacy class. A note here, okay, maybe I should just say it, is that conjugacy versus uh, stable conjugacy is different here. So one should, be, one should be aware. This is calculating conjugacy, not stable conjugacy. And for the Archimedean refinement, we are letting, that's what I was saying, this is 2 pi to the g, this is a direct generalization of uh, what we had in the GL2 case. So this is the discriminant function of GSP2G, which I haven't written it up. So, uh, one may ask, what is this d gamma? Because this time we're not actually starting with d gamma. Well, you can either take it as just a, this infinite, seemingly infinite product, which is not, or you could actually lift this element to a, excuse me, uh, a rational element and actually look at the discriminant of that rational element. They both work. This is well defined up to q bar conjugacy. Uh, but in any case, basically the same refinements can be done. And the theorem is the following. So we're fixing a principally polarized abelian variety over FP. So now there's no simplicity assumption over here. That was just for the heuristic. So we want commutative endomorphism ring. And we're assuming it's either ordinary or that this finite field Q is P. This is, for, this is a technical matter. I don't think it is necessary that much. Uh, this Q equals P. Um, then the following mass formula holds. So n, the number of things in the isogeny class of our fixed principally polarized abelian variety is q to the gg plus 1 over 4, so this is the crude heuristic, times the Archimedean correction factor times all the elatic factors. Well, here is a Tamagawa number popping up. As you can imagine, this was 1 in the GL2 case. And while well, this is the Tamagawa number of the torus, this is the centralizer that always uh, came up. So for algebra geometry minded audience, this is the, uh, uh, the, the Q points or R points of actually of this, or you could basically think of this as the centralizer of this element that we use to define D gamma. So uh, this, we have not calculated this yet. Uh, I'm not even sure if uh, there's, maybe it is well known in the, uh, well known to the expert. As far as I know, I'm, uh, so this is one for GL2. Uh, Wen Wei Li informed me that this is actually one for GSP 2G when G is odd, and it is two for GSP 4. Maybe there is a formula, it's one or two. It's uh, 
It's unclear to me at the moment. If anybody knows, I'd love to discuss. Uh, but very brief sketch of the proof, and I will leave it here. So the, just to remark, well, recall what was happening in G equals one case, there were five steps, Lang and Kotwitz, Langlands Kotwitz, excuse me, compare canonical to geometric orbital integrals, geometric to local masses, calculate volume, calculate the geometric orbital integral. So several things actually carry very straightforward. The first step is still there, as I told you, that's due to Kotwitz. Uh, the rest of the steps need extra ingredients. Basically, the issue is that the centralizer is more complicated. The rest of the stuff is, can be handled, but the centralizer is complicated. So like calculating these geometric volumes and stuff is not that straightforward. So for that, we actually move a, take a roundabout approach. There's a very beautiful paper of Scheer, which builds up on Ono's results on uh, tor tori, basically, and uh, like algebraic tori in general and their uh, mass formula, where he gives an analytic class number formula for a general torus. So this is a very, very general torus. The classical analytic class number formula is just a sheer special case of this. So you should read this as h times the regulator is, take this as one, doesn't matter, the number of roots of unity times the Tamagawa number times the discriminant. So this is like the uh, L value, and then put everything on the other side, it basically looks like L of one is equal to class number over discriminant times the regulator over the uh, number of roots of unity. So I need to tell you one thing about this is he evaluates, this formula comes by just evaluating a mass. Now this itself is actually a mass formula. So he evaluates the volume of this torus with respect to a certain measure which he calls, which we will call shear measure. It's a very close cousin of the canonical measure. It's not very different. Remember, canonical measure was the measure that was giving one to the integral point. Um, then the thing is, our proof, the basic idea is use Shear's construction as a midway. So instead of going from geometric to canonical now, go through Shear. It's much easier. And the thing is, if you do a little bit of a detailed study of what Shear does, is uh, the payoff of this detailed study is that you did not actually have to calculate this geometric measure of these uh, integral points of the tori or the canonical measure because they cancel each other out in the calculation anyways. And Shear's calculation is very much implicit. Uh, I was gonna tell you a little bit more detail but I think uh, it's better to stop here. But basically Shear makes us avoid this extra calculation that was very straightforward in GL2 but it's fairly non-straightforward in GSP2 gene in generality and then just go over go around this whole calculation. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, any uh, quick questions for uh, Ali? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. I should. <laughs> I didn't know that either. But it's a, uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions or comments? If not, let's thank Ali. Okay, so to remind you, we are